Welcome to Teleforum, a podcast of the Federal Society's practice groups. I'm Dean Reuter, Vice President, General Counsel, and Director of Practice Groups at the Federal Society. For exclusive access to live recordings of practice group Teleforum calls, become a Federal Society member today at fedsoc.org. Welcome, everyone, to this Federalist Society Teleform Conference Call. As this afternoon, April 26, 2021, we're having a Courthouse Steps Oral Argument Teleforum, reviewing arguments that were heard uh, earlier this morning in a case called Americans for Prosperity Foundation versus Becerra. I'm Nick Marr, Assistant Director of Practice Groups here at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that expressions of opinion on today's call are those of our expert. We're very pleased to be joined this afternoon by Mr. Eric Jaffe. He's a partner at Share Jaffe, an appellate litigator, widely experienced. He's also the chair of our free speech and election law practice group. Uh, So we're very pleased to have Mr. Jaffe here today to review the case and discuss implications. So with that, Eric, thanks very much for being with us. The floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you very much. And thanks to the Federal Society for sponsoring this. Uh, As everyone who's logged into this teleform undoubtedly knows this morning there was arguments in Americans for Prosperity Foundation versus, well, it was Rodriguez. I think the name has now changed, Uh, but uh, it was Becerra originally. But anyway, versus California. Let's just leave it at that. Uh, And the argument went quite well, uh, though I suspect we will get a fairly narrow decision that at the end of the day will do about as much damage as it did good. Um, So opening for AFP uh, for the petitioners uh, was uh, Derek Schaefer, uh, who I thought did an excellent job and particularly had a a masterful uh, knowledge of the record so that he would routinely cite folks to particular parts of the record backing up his arguments, which I think was the strength of AFP's case in general, is having a very well-developed record, uh, and and did, did... did a very good job arguing uh, for the position, just ran into a lot of skepticism on a variety of aspects of his argument. Uh, I'll basically go through sort of what I thought were the highlights of the different justices uh, in the order in which they generally, in order of seniority, so the order that they ask questions, and sort of point out what I think uh, were the big issues that concerned them uh, and that uh, got their attention. Um, so starting with the Chief Justice, uh, he, he, right out of the box, started expressing a concern with uh, two things. One uh, that struck me was he seemed worried about the level of scrutiny and, and with an interest, it, it seemed to me, in keeping it as a watered down version of scrutiny, something that was not so aggressive as strict scrutiny. So asking about what's the difference between exacting scrutiny and strict scrutiny. So he he sort of focuses on, is it strict scrutiny or is it exacting scrutiny? And uh, I thought the whole exercise was designed to sort of guarantee that whatever level of scrutiny came out was weak enough to save things that the court liked uh, while strong enough to perhaps take care of this. So I think, in general, he may have been decently sympathetic to AFP, at least on an as-applied basis, and potentially even on a facial challenge basis. But it struck me that he didn't want to adopt a legal rule that would influence future cases, particularly in the context of campaign finance, or perhaps by a similar challenge to the IRS Schedule B disclosure requirements. Uh, followed, but following the chief. Uh, but one, one, not following. So, so the chief did actually ask a number of questions that I thought were helpful to the petitioners. Uh, in particular, sort of what does it take to show chill? Uh, he sort of asks this sort of you know lob question to the petitioners' counsel, saying, "So, what what could you possibly have shown more than you showed to show chill? Because AFP, of course, had shown threats, death threats, you know, all kinds of uh, consequences to association with AFP that you would think would be enough to show chill for their donors and." And yet the other side doesn't think it was enough. And the chief, I think more rhetorically than anything else, said, what more could you have possibly shown? Uh, so at least it, it says to me that he is sympathetic to the as-applied challenge, but he may not be so sympathetic to the uh, facial challenge and, more importantly, is looking to keep the legal rules uh, sufficiently narrow to not have a large future implication. Uh, Clarence Thomas, Justice Thomas, uh, came in, uh, and his, his his major concern across all of the questioners – 
it's uh, all of the uh, the arguers. It seems to me is sort of what happens to donors who are associated with vilified groups. So it's the sort of the advent of extreme vilification of groups. He gave examples of folks who are called racist, who are called white supremacists. That we have now moved on from disagreeing with people to vilifying them in a way that may make it impossible for folks to associate with them at all. Uh, and that seemed to be his primary concern: is what protection do you give to donors of groups that might be labeled fairly or unfairly uh, in more extreme terms? Uh, that, of course, suggests to me that he's quite sympathetic to the petitioners. Uh, and, and in particular, maybe even sympathetic to a facial challenge that just sort of says anybody donating has to disclose. Uh, he did uh, echo some concern with the IRS disclosure rules, uh, implicitly sort of suggesting that perhaps those are okay. But, but what? how would one distinguish a regime in California that just mirrored the IRS rules? And this was a theme that came up elsewhere. Uh, and I think that's a fair question. You could see that the justices, Justice Thomas in particular, and other justices generally, are both concerned with perhaps protecting IRS disclosure requirements, which has some different interests involved and perhaps different safeguards involved, but worried that California would then just adopt a rule that mirrored the IRS, but perhaps not be quite as trustworthy as the federal government in protecting the information they got a hold of. Uh, so that, I thought that was an interesting theme on his part, and that was a theme echoed throughout. Uh, Justice Breyer, not surprisingly, his questions reflected a greater uh, concern for the government interests involved and a greater weight to the government interests involved, uh, including things like deterrence. The part of the trouble with the record in this case, of course, is that California was incapable of showing that they actually used these, you know, mass disclosed forms for any meaningful purpose. And so it was left to many of the amici, uh, California's amici, to try to come up with a reason why mass disclosure of your donors it might be might be valuable even in the face of the ability to get more specific disclosure if you were actually investigating somebody. And Justice Breyer sort of took up the, the took up the flag for that position and came up with a lot of reasons why perhaps the government had an interest in deterring people, even if they never used the forms, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and ultimately sort of asked questions that suggested he wanted a balancing test. So uh, balancing the state's interest uh, in deterring fraud, the IRS's interest in enforcing the tax laws, or even the campaign finance situations. And ultimately, I think his most telling question was, isn't this just a stalking horse for campaign finance? So in many ways, he you know, was staking out the position and asking questions that staked out the position for why don't we just have a basic balancing test? Uh, you know, if the government has an important interest and uh, you know, your interest in, in, in being scared isn't so big, uh, too bad, so sad. Uh, and I think in some ways that sort of echoed a little bit of the chief's concerns with not having too strict a level of scrutiny. I don't think the chief would go as far as to the sort of ad hoc balancing that Justice Breyer was implicitly suggesting, but certainly you can sort of see a commonality of interest across those sets of questioning. Uh, then we get to uh, Justice Alito, next in the line of seniority, and he was, I think, far more sympathetic to the petitioner's position, uh, especially in the as applies context, but perhaps in the facial context context as well, uh, asking sort of what more could you possibly need to win an as applied challenge than the death threats and, and attacks shown, actually shown in this case, and the actual leaked information in this case. Uh, and he sort of, you know, got some answers there. And obviously, he's asking, initially asking this of a sympathetic audience who says, well, I don't know what else we could have had. But when he asks it to the other side, they keep sort of saying, well, you know, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and so, you know, if there was somebody who had a legitimate fear, uh, we would get, you know, they would be entitled to an exception. But of course, they couldn't, they wouldn't even admit that this plaintiff had a legitimate fear in the face of death threats to members and donors. Uh, so one wonders where, if ever, the exception would apply. And that was exactly the question Justice Alito asks uh, and said, so did, did California ever give an exception? And do they have to go to court every time? And I think the short answer he got by the end of the argument was, yes, they have to go to court every time, and even then they probably lose. Uh, 
though I don't think they said it quite as bluntly, that was plainly the answer. So given that those are the answers to his concerns, I imagine Justice Alito will, at a minimum, be pretty sympathetic to the facial cha- to the, the as-applied challenge and may even go further into a facial challenge, given that the regime here provides no meaningful protection other than having to go to court every time on an individual one-off basis for any nonprofit that was worried that its donors would run away. Which, you know, while maybe not all of the nonprofits would certainly be quite a few of them. Then we get to Justice Sotomayor, who I thought had a fairly balanced approach in terms of what she was signaling and concerned about. Uh, you know, she wasn't, uh, wasn't necessarily all one way or the other. Uh, she, she, like the chief, was concerned with not wanting to expand a, a narrow tailoring requirement or the least restrictive means requirement. So I think that, you know, we're seeing a theme of nobody thinks strict scrutiny really would apply here, even though that was the position taken by the Thomas More Society, uh, Foundation or Society. I'm sorry, I mess up their name. But uh, I think uh, AFP had taken a more balanced position that says even under sort of somewhat more lenient, uh, you know, sort of exacting scrutiny as opposed to strict scrutiny, uh, you still had to have some tailoring requirement. And uh, with uh, Justice Sotomayor, she sort of questioned exactly what degree of tailoring would sort of that entail. It didn't have to be the least restrictive, but it couldn't be nothing. So, but where do you come out in that? Uh, and particularly with concern for other cases, past cases, where uh, any level of tailoring might have led to a different result. The example she gives is the Doe case that involved verifying signatures on petitions for referenda, which didn't seem to have a whole lot of tailoring at all, or at least it just wasn't considered and discussed. Uh, and she was quite concerned with that. She also seemed concerned with, you know, sort of not giving adequate credit to the state's interest in this case uh, in the sense of, you know, deterrence, much like Justice Breyer, deterrence, or whether a, a direct audit led it to a particular target of interest might tip them off and they would somehow hide things. Uh, and even such simple concerns, state interest says, it just saves us time to have them all in a warehouse so we don't have to ask for them again. Uh, and that, of course, is from a First Amendment perspective quite troubling that one would credit such seemingly unlikely and unproven interests uh, as a substantial state interest under a weakened version of scrutiny. But that certainly seemed to be where the, the, the point of the questioning was heading, is that you know almost anything the state vomits onto a page counts as a substantial interest, and then we just engage in some degree of lesser or greater balancing and scrutiny as to whether or not they uh, have tailored things enough with uh, the key word there being being uh, balancing of the tailoring to the the interest. Uh, I will say that she was, uh, where I was pleased with her questioning, was she was quite sympathetic to the as-applied challenge, that for whatever sort of loosey-goosey rules might apply to sort of overall challenges, she seemed rather sympathetic to the notion that AFP in this instance had sort of demonstrated the threat to them, had sort of suggested that there was no adequate tailoring as to them. And so I could once again see... Uh, uh, sort of a split baby decision that uh, gives the as applied challenge to AFP, but sort of on standards that few others uh, will be able to satisfy in the future. Uh, Justice Kagan, I thought, had some interesting questions next, uh, particularly, uh, I think, targeted at going after the, the facial challenge. Uh, she, she sort of said, so, you know, what degree of burden in terms of how many instances does this law have to be burdensome in order to justify a facial challenge? What if most private organizations and their donors are perfectly happy to have their, their donors disclosed because they're perfectly innocuous organizations? that don't care, and in fact, like having their donors disclosed, and the donors like being disclosed because they like associating with those organizations. I assume you would think of things like the Red Cross or, or other places that are just sort of generic do-good kind of places, as opposed to controversial kind of places. Uh, and she thought that might, the, uh, that alone might be enough to stop a facial challenge and, and force you into a, a private challenge. I thought Petitioner had interesting answers to that and said that you know the level of facial challenge uh, impact is only measured 
guard against those who would object, not those who would voluntarily comply, citing like a city of Los Angeles case. Uh, I'll let the court fight about that and worry about, you know, the subtleties of facial versus as applied. But it seemed to me that she was pretty, pretty um, non-sympathetic to the facial challenge. On on the as applied challenge, uh, she asked some interesting hypotheticals about what if there was less of a risk of public disclosure. Uh, of course, California uh, historically has done an appalling job of keeping the supposedly private information private. Uh, they claim to have improved uh, their procedures. Of course, their claims were that the regulations just codify the f- informal procedures that failed miserably in the past. But, you know, leave that be that as it may, let's take California at its word that it will uh, do better in the future than it has in the past. And uh, Justice Kagan, I thought, interestingly explored uh, what degree of certainty of things staying private are needed before the fears of donors of public disclosure no longer weighed in the First Amendment balance. Uh, And, uh, you know, look, to me, that signaled a little bit of a forward-looking uh, path and less of a concern with what happened to this particular case than what would happen to future as-applied challengers once California could pass the laugh test of, sure, we'll keep your data private. Of course we will. Nobody here but us chickens. Nobody will tell anyone. We promise. We promise. We promise. Uh, and she seemed more sympathetic to, to giving California the benefit of the doubt on those things. As you can imagine, given my sarcasm right now, uh, I, of course, didn't find that terribly persuasive. Um, but anyway, uh, th- therefore, I think there's some chance that she would join the as-applied uh, ruling in favor of AFP if that comes down, but would not certainly uh, be in favor of a facial challenge. And my suspicion is even in an as-applied challenge, few future uh, challengers would be able to satisfy the same level of, of, of leniency towards the state. Uh, Justice Gorsuch, uh, once again, as expected, was more sympathetic to the challenge, including to the facial challenges, uh, and asking interesting questions about whether the right to private association or anonymous association was a standalone right or merely a derivative right designed to facilitate uh, speech or other uh, First Amendment activities. The answer he got, I think, from the petitioner was obviously it's a standalone right, and I think there was a there was a repeated reference back to the, the brief by the Beckett f- Fund uh, making exactly this argument that it's a, it's a standalone independent right, and hence the burden would be direct rather than indirect. Uh, as you could imagine, the United States, as amicus, uh, and California came in uh, and said, no, it's merely a derivative right, and that you have to sort of weigh the burden of, of loss of privacy, but that loss of privacy per se is not itself a violation. It's only a problem if it chills. Uh, then we get to Justice Kavanaugh. I think a lot of his questions focused on sort of how do you distinguish the IRS? How do you distinguish other instances? And to my mind, echoed a little bit the chief's implicit concerns with not wanting a rule that reached too far. Uh, he, again, seemed you know somewhat sympathetic, I think, to the particulars of the case, but uh, more concerned with what rule one would lay down and how one would distinguish the IRS and whether California could roll in with an IRS-like scheme and and be able to then get the same information. Uh, and and it, it wasn't a great signaling as to sort of how he thought that played out at the end of the day, his questions, but, but his questions definitely focused on that issue that was troubling him. So I take that to signal that he doesn't want to dump the IRS or at least not prematurely dump the IRS disclosure requirements, uh, but was certainly uh, more concerned with California's disclosure requirements. Uh, and finally, we get to Justice Barrett, Justice Coney Barrett, uh, and I think like Justice Gorsuch was uh, concerned with the nature of the right of association, was concerned that whatever test gets adopted here not collapse down to an interest balancing test. Uh, I am, you know, I, I call to mind sort of the commentary in the Second Amendment cases, in the Heller case in particular, where for something to be a protected constitutional right can't just be an interest balancing that ad hoc interest balancing is essentially useless. And her questions seem to echo that same theme of if we adopt a sort of a random interest balancing of, does the state have a good enough reason to to infringe upon these concerns, that that wouldn't be terribly protective. Uh, And I thought that was the theme of her questions throughout uh, a lot of it. But, But again, 
I, I took that to be somewhat sympathetic to a facial approach, but not overly, uh, but, but, but more sympathetic to the as applied approach. Uh, so that's sort of the summary of the, the concerns and issues that I thought the different justices raised. A couple of things, uh, I, I, I was particularly struck by the position of the United States in this case. And it's of note because, of course, this is one of the few early cases uh, where the Biden administration is weighing in orally. Uh, I think Ms. Prelegar or, or acting Solicitor General Prelegar, I believe it is, uh, she argues that so this is, I don't know if it's her maiden vo uh, voyage as a acting SG, or if there was an earlier one, I apologize for my not having looked it up. But she, you know, she did a very good job. She's a very good advocate. I was just vaguely appalled by the position of the United States, which was, we agree the case should be vacated and remanded. But other than that, we sort of disagree with everything the petitioner said. <laughs> uh, it was one of those uh, give with one hand, take with, you know, 50 hands. Uh, and so they wanted a remand for the Ninth Circuit to rule on the as applied challenge and to see whether there was really a concern for donors being chilled. Uh, and in the face of the record on hand, that seems laughable, uh, and, and therefore one has to take it as a disingenuous suggestion that I toss it back to the Ninth Circuit, where we know what the Ninth Circuit's going to do about this. They're going to rule in favor of California. and but, but at least we get to pretend we were on the side of the free speech, even though we know, as applied, these folks are going to lose in the end. Uh, and so uh, I found it a bit appalling that they wanted to pretend to be in favor of free speech, but not actually. What the bulk of the U.S.'s argument was, it seemed to me, was uh, how can we save campaign finance? How can we save IRS? How can we make the test as squishy as humanly possible while not admitting that we don't really care about the privacy of association? And so all of the suggestions were uh, of the nature of, well, privacy may be important in an individual case. It's really highly fact-bound. You'd have to see. We'd have to have evidence. We'd have to have the individual as applied entity prove to a reasonable degree that they really felt chilled. And then, and only then, if they proved that, we would have to weigh it against the state's interests, which could be almost anything. And, you know, the benefits that they claim were, you know, we, we would recognize all kinds of benefits that would outweigh even a proved burden on donor privacy and chill. Uh, and so, you know, welcome to campaign finance as the stalking horse. I think this was proving Justice Breyer's point that this this case is a stalking horse for campaign finance for most of the advocates, uh, certainly for, for well, for most of the advocates other than, ironically, AFP, which went out of its way to distinguish, to try to distinguish campaign finance as involving different concerns and different matters, and just to win their case for charitable donors. Uh, uh, so AFP was the only one who was actually litigating the case at hand. Everyone else was litigating the case they all see coming down the line of campaign finance or perhaps the IRS disclosure forms. And there you had it. So I thought the U.S. played its hand. As for California, nothing surprising there. They defended their law. They pretended that they had fixed their problems. They touted the district courts, uh, commending them for having improved upon their horrible track record of disclosure closing everyone's forms in the past, uh, failing to note that the district court, while commending them for the effort, it was like a participation award. Good for you for trying, but it wasn't good enough, is what the district court said. And California just quotes the good for you for trying part of that quote. Uh, so, you know, uh, while, you know, California did what it could and sort of suggested that they had other interests, they were less compelling. I thought the U.S. ultimately probably did a better job of helping them to win, even though nominally the U.S. was not on their side uh, than they did, uh, and my apologies to the advocate, because really she was stuck with a crummy record, <laughs> and it wasn't her fault. So, you know, she, she did what she could with what she had, and there you have it. So with that said, uh, my overall sense of this is that on an as-applied challenge, I could see a substantial I could I could see an eight one or, or seven two to nine zero vote in favor of petitioners on an as applied challenge, though I would not 
be terribly surprised to see some, you know, uh, six three. Or, or worse, uh, peel off and sort of suggest a remand of the as applied challenge with some some language suggesting that they probably ought to win, but let's leave it to the Ninth Circuit. But uh, but I think ultimately the as applied challenge wins. I'm having a very hard time counting to five on the facial challenge aspect of this law, though though you know one could count Justice Alito, Justice Gorsuch, Justice Barrett, Justice Thomas as four, and then the question is whether or not. Justice Kavanaugh or the chief uh, come on board thinking that uh, forcing groups into repeated as-applied challenges is basically the death knell. Uh, I think it would be a pyrrhic victory, much the way uh, Petitioner's counsel suggested it would be. Uh, it, you know, AFP has been litigating this for seven years, and look where they've gotten, and nobody else challenging uh, a state disclosure requirement is likely to to get further ahead on these repeated as applied challenges. So maybe we peel off the chief or Kavanaugh, but I think their concerns, their sort of institutional and jurisprudential concerns might cause them to hesitate a bit, particularly if they can sort of uh, support an as applied win that at least sets some rules or some road, you know, some ground rules about what future as applied folks might have to show. And if they can get some strong ground rules for the as-applied challenges in the future, maybe uh, the answer is though it won't be quite as pyrrhic as petitioners' counsel suspected it would be. Uh, so, with that said, uh, I am happy to open it up to questions and comments. Uh, if you're going to make a comment, I'd rather you keep it short and ultimately make it a question rather than uh, extended discussion. But uh, with that said, any questions, I'm happy to entertain. Thanks very much, Eric. And yes, we do encourage questions and, and really only questions, but um, we'll get there. So now we're going to open the floor um, for questions. And we already have uh, one question in the queue, so we'll go to it. Uh, hi, this is Gregory Dolan from University of Baltimore. Um, have, uh, first of all, thank you so much for a very informative and lively uh, presentation. Um, and so my question is goes towards um, uh, what you sort of started with, and <clears throat> I think what was sort of through uh, kind of the con conversation to, uh, throughout about sort of this IRS disclosure and as well as like how it would play out with the states. Now, IRS certainly has a much better record than California. California does when it comes to disclosure rather than non-disclosure of information. And, but so I wonder, like, what if California had this disclosure requirement in, the, in their tax code, but for one reason or another, their, uh, you know, tax authorities are less, um, how should I put it, professional in deciding, you know, in keeping the information, private information, in fact, private. Um, so basically, you have the same result, but uh, you know, but the 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 statute is in a, in, a, in a different code, in a different section. So the question, I guess, I would have is like, how would the uh, the petitioners or the you know their the amici actually uh, resolve that uh, that issue? So I think the the position of the petitioners was several fold. Uh, one, they sort of said, look, uh, the IRS has different interests in the state of California. But 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 assuming uh, arguendo that the state of California sort of asked for this information to help enforce their own tax laws and limited the information they sought to entities subject to Cal, you know, that were taxed in California rather than entities all around the country who might merely get donations from folks in California. You know, if, if it was narrowed in all the ways that made sense, I think their answer would be, in that instance, uh, there would at least be a, a state interest that was credible, at, unlike here, where California didn't have an interest that barely passed the laugh test, according to AFP, and in my opinion, they're, they're right. Um, so so you, you would at least have a real uh, scrutiny analysis going on, given that the interest would be more substantial. Uh, and then in terms of the professionalism or non-professionalism, I think everyone, uh, both petitioners and others, would say it's really a matter of, is there 
there a reasonable fear that it's going to get out? So if the answer is the IRS has a pretty good track record of keeping your information secret, then there's not that reasonable a fear that the information is going to get out or be misused. And, and I would point out that the IRS, of course, has rules against giving that information out even within the federal government, much less publicly. You can't transfer it to other agencies just willy-nilly. Uh, and so, you know, it sort of mitigates the concern of sort of political use of this information to attack your enemies. So if California had all that and, and could sort of prove that they were pretty good at it, I imagine everyone would say that the result would be similar. Of course, no one believes that California could ever manage to be that professional or ever manage to actually not use it for their own nefarious purposes. And so I suppose we would just have to have proof on that, and that would be the subject of a trial. Uh, you know, obviously, you can all tell from my sarcasm that I am not sympathetic to California here. In fact, I had a brief in this case in support of petitioners. Um, but, you know, you never know. You've got to give this to a trial judge and take evidence on it. And maybe one of these days, California actually gets their act together and stops misusing access to information at the governmental level. Uh, it's possible. I, I, you know, never say never. So that's how I think they would handle it. And I think that would uh, impact everyone else's analysis in the sense that they would want a more or less fact-bound determination of whether donors had a realistic and reasonable fear that the information was going to get disclosed or otherwise misused. Thank you. We have other questions. Well, just another, yep, I was just about to say, the floor is wide open. So, um, so Eric, well, you must have done a great job reviewing. We've got about well, <laughs> so many people think, in the audience, but... Yeah, no to give people a so chance far. to think about questions, I just one of the things that you know I touched upon, but I, I I'd like I wouldn't mind expanding upon a little bit is you know to give Beckett the proper shout out. The, the Beckett Fund's amicus brief got mentioned uh, repeatedly uh, in terms of the argument of whether or not the right to assemble includes the right to assemble privately, uh, and whether that is a standalone First Amendment right, so that forcing disclosure isn't merely a, an indirect burden on the right to speech or association, but is on its face a violation of, you know, or an infringement of a First Amendment right. And I thought that was a, a an interesting and fun debate to have, uh, and one that was taken up, like I said, uh, by a number of the justices, particularly Justice Gorsuch and Justice, uh, Justice Barrett. Uh, and so, uh, kudos to Beckett for, for sort of going on the historical route to this. Uh, kudos to petitioners for sort of calling it out and endorsing it. Uh, and I think it's important because I think one of the trouble, one of the problems with NAACP versus Louisiana is that it did treat this as sort of an indirect infringement upon the right to association and therefore came up with what was ultimately uh, viewed by many courts as a weaker standard of scrutiny, which is how you get to this squishy, it's not quite intermediate, but it's not quite strict, which therefore means we do what we feel like. Uh, and so uh, it's a good debate to have. Uh, it's a debate that I imagine might catch Justice Thomas's attention as well, given the historical uh, basis for it. And, uh, you know, it sort of deals with a, a recurring problem in free association cases, which is the standards are just a bit squish. And so invariably, when you have squishy standards like that, courts then decide whether they like the the parties or don't like the parties and rule accordingly. So, you know, the NAACP rightfully wins in this situation, but AFP wrongfully loses. Whereas I think that they both should win because I don't think there's any question that donors will face retribution if, it, if they're outed uh, and that uh, that chills donors uh, or, or chills members in the NAACP case. Uh, so, you know, that was an interesting debate. So uh, while I Thanks, yabbered sir. on, do we have new questions? Thanks. We do, and actually, a, a quick um, apology to our audience. My my screen software had uh, like delayed. We actually have about six questions, so well, let's get uh, to we'll them. go to them one at a time, and we'll take them in order. So, just a quick comment. Uh, it, it does seem uh, like we might be heading to a new area where the Supreme Court's respect for the states isn't what it used to be, at least when it comes to certain states like California. Um, beyond that, though, what I'm interested in is whether or not this is a stalking horse. If the idea that uh, freedom of association and freedom to associate anonymously is, uh, you know, a uh, fundamental right, 
then I don't see how we have, uh, you know, any disclosure requirements um, for political donations. And I guess that's where my question is. It seems like in the NAACP, the concern was violence and retribution outside speech. Here, the retribution for AFP and these conservative organizations is actually more speech. They imbue more criticism. And that's what their donors are afraid of is greater speech and greater criticism. They're not afraid of violence as far as I've been able to tell. So I wanted to uh, get some comments from the uh, speech on that. So uh, I would just point out that read the record. The record shows actual death threats. The record shows, you know, lots of uh, economic retaliation. It's not just speech. Uh, and you may not think that, uh, look, uh, there's at least economic retaliation. I might be with you on the notion that that's called free association. And just because I don't want to do business with you because you're, because I think you're a heinous person and your views are heinous and your associates are heinous, uh, to me, that might fall into the category of free association. And so it's not so much that. But as to the anonymity aspect of it, I, I think it's they're less worried about more speech because, of course, AFP itself is speaking and people can criticize AFP all they want. The real question is whether people attack you for donating money. But but to the beginning part of your question, uh, which is, is it a stalking horse? Well, of course, it's a stalking horse to some degree, because if, if you don't recognize the right to private association, Association at all, well, then the campaign finance cases go away because there's no interest on the other side. But recognizing that there is indeed a, a, a meaningful First Amendment right uh, to uh, privately associate doesn't end the inquiry. Uh, and I think the easy example of that is the Buckley case, where Buckley, in fact, applied strict scrutiny to disclosure laws and found that they they survived strict scrutiny in the campaign finance context precisely because of the corruption concerns and the sort of indirect influence on candidate concerns. But remember, here we're not talking about influencing candidates. We're talking about charities who may influence public debate in some sense in terms of talking about public issues. But I don't think anyone imagines that this is holding some candidate in their pocket uh, through you know some monetary tie, which is what Buckley was more concerned about. So while it does certainly impact Whatever, whatever rules or, or guidelines they set out here impacts this could influence campaign finance cases. It's not at all clear that it influences it quite as much as people suggest, given, given Buckley's precedent of recognizing a right, recognizing strict scrutiny, and still upholding the law. Uh, it's only a matter of whether or not campaign finance laws can escape that level of scrutiny altogether and then just have free reign to make everybody disclose everything, a la uh, Senator Whitehouse who would, you know, pick it, you know, write down an enemy's list and wait and see who contributed to them and presumably attack those folks uh, and attack anyone they supported, say, a uh, judicial candidate, uh, as he has done in the past. So I think that's the bigger debate. But like I said, uh, it wasn't a stalking horse as brought by AFP, because AFP, the whole premise of their case was, uh, we're not campaign finance, and you don't need to touch that with a 10-foot pole, and please don't, because you can let us win on sort of the normal, everyday grounds of First Amendment stuff that apply to us differently. So there you have it. Next question. Great. Uh, go ahead with your question. Yeah, I I have a question of what would an as-applied decision in this case look like? Would it be based on the fact that California was derelict in releasing the information, or it would be some subset of the uh, charities that would not have to disclose this? Well, it wouldn't be a subset of the charities. It would be AFP. And I, well, I guess uh, and it's like the companion case of Thomas More. But AFP put in evidence about why they and their donors had a reasonable fear of retaliation and harassment. Uh, and they had evidence of it happening in the past to them. They had evidence of threats. And they had evidence of all kinds of retaliation. Uh, and so they would just say, OK, as to you, AFP. This is the evidence you put in. That seems like it triggers the proper level of scrutiny, and uh, there has to be some level of tailoring, which we don't think was met in this case. Uh, given the record in this case, it would be a very specific ruling as to AFP. Obviously, it would set some guidelines and some precedent as to future challenges that looked a lot like this, uh, and it would sort of 
tell you implicitly what degree of evidence would get you over the hump, the same degree of evidence that AFP introduced. But no, I don't think it would automatically apply to other groups. I think other groups would have to then raise their hand and say, we fear retaliation. California would have to then say, too bad, so sad, disclose anyway, and then there'd be a lawsuit. And we, it would go from there. And this is one of the concerns AFP raised in saying why the as applied challenge alone wouldn't be enough because, okay, so are all of these other organizations really going to bring lawsuits? And do they, can they afford to bring lawsuits and litigate for seven years? Uh, and at the end of the day, what you're doing is ultimately penal, in, imposing a financial penalty on them to have to come and sue in order to protect donor privacy, uh, which may be as much or greater than the loss of donors that they would face by just sort of doing what California has to do, hence the Peric victory aspect of it. Uh, I think that's what an as-applied ruling would look like. All righty. Let's go to our next question now. Uh, are any briefs uh, filed in this case referring to laws or regulations in other democracies in terms of giving illustrative examples of how the court might finesse this issue? No one that I know cited those briefs. I can't imagine that somebody didn't say that. But to be honest, I didn't read all the amicus briefs. And certainly it wasn't an argument anybody here uh, in this argument chose to make about other democracies do this this way. Uh, and, you know, look, at this point, with five conservatives, you'd be spitting on their shoes to make that argument. Gee, England does it this way. Why don't we? Yeah, good way to lose an argument uh, in, in, in terms of this court. And I think at this point, the only justice who might take such an argument even half seriously would be Justice Breyer. Uh, nobody imagines that such precedent in a, in, from countries that don't have comparable First Amendment regimes would much matter. England obviously has a much weaker First Amendment regime. Israel has sort of a common law-ish First Amendment regime. I'm not really sure where you would look to sort of get a sufficiently analogous protective place that said, who cares uh, if we scare off donors to charities? Uh, remember, in the campaign world, you might have a, a, a different argument about the need for public knowing about who's speaking in terms of campaigns. But in terms of charities, and remember, the interest here was had nothing to do with public disclosure. The interest here was we want to enforce against potential fraud on the charities themselves, because maybe they're self-dealing, maybe there's something like that. This had nothing to do with these sort of democratic arguments that get made of, well, the public needs to know who's really speaking. This was not about that. This was explicitly not about that, actually, with California saying, no, 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 we're never going to tell anybody about this, and we're not going to use it for those other purposes. We're only using it to make sure nobody's cheating the charity. Uh, and of course, largely unable to come up with examples where this information had ever played a meaningful role in such sort of law enforcement concerns. All right, great. Let's go to our next question now. You have the floor. Hi. Um, I'm calling from Minnesota and from a nonprofit organization, and thank you for sharing about this, and I'm particularly concerned about what you say the applied decision would look like. I will uh, tell you, I, I mean, my thought is that other groups didn't sue because they didn't have the ability, and I'm I'm so curious that, like, why Goldwater's uh, uh, concerns, I mean, that, you know, they've done some suing, or why the other... D so I've got two questions. Why the other cases that uh, went f forward in some way on this issue were, weren't like pulled in or references to why this shouldn't just be AFP? And then the other thing is just to say that we have actually had a donor who asked, um, no one will see this uh, information, right? And I said, well, actually, there are some states that are asking for it for anyone who gives over $5,000. And so this donor gave us $4,999 to make sure, yeah. right? So yep, that absolutely. is not, it is not, it's not, I mean, it's a real concern as soon as they know, but I would guess that most groups don't tell their donors that this is possible. 
Well, I mean, I, you know, there were a number of questions that actually had hypotheticals very much like your factual situation, where they said, so what if a donor comes and says, I'm willing to give to you, but only if you can promise me it's not going to be disclosed? And the, the answer is, well, we can't promise that. How can we possibly promise that? Because these different places are asking for it. Uh, so they, the court was very aware of those situations. And when I say that the, an as-applied ruling would only be in the particular context of AFP, uh, recognize that it still creates precedent. It's, it's, it simply doesn't, on its face, dispose of these challenges by other groups like Goldwater or whoever. Um, those cases are still out there, and those cases would all be subject to whatever sort of general statements of law and principles of law get laid down in the as-applied challenge. It's just they wouldn't automatically win. They would then have to go back to their courts, whatever court they were in, and say, okay, the implications of the ruling in the AFP case means I should win too because my evidence is just as good as theirs, the state interest on the other side is just as bad as California's because uh, my donors have expressed a concern and have been chilled. They would just have to make the more granular showing as to them that they were entitled to the same result. So it's not that it wouldn't benefit all of those other groups that are out there, but it wouldn't benefit them in the same way that a facial challenge would be, a facial ruling would benefit them, assuming a facial ruling came out in favor of AFP, then, then all of those cases would be resolved. There would be no further need for a lot of debate on the particulars of any given group. Uh, they would all probably win almost outright if they were even in the ballpark. So that's the difference between those two types of rulings and the implications of those two types of rulings. Uh, is it takes an extra few steps for other groups to win. And, and quite candidly, many other groups may just not have the resources to litigate this further or to litigate this over and over. I mean, those groups that have already started litigating it, good for them. They've made the cost-benefit analysis and have chosen to litigate. But, you know, you can never guarantee that for all the other groups that might be impacted. Thank you. Great. We'll go to our next question now. Go ahead with your question. Yes, assuming I, you know, that uh, the, re- the the reasons are, you know, I, I don't know what the real re- whether the real reason is just to get information uh, you know, to to combat fraud or if there are other purposes involved. But two things you haven't talked about, and I don't know whether they came up at all. In addition to if things were released, in addition to the fear of retaliation, there are two other factors. Uh, one is some people want to donate anonymously so they don't get hounded by other people wanting money. And secondly, there is a pretty strong tradition, in uh, at least somewhat religiously, although not always, that giving should be done without any um, any uh, recognition because you're trying to give to help the cause, not to get personal recognition. Um, and this rule, was, was that rule discussed at all or that factor discussed at all? Uh, it was mentioned briefly by petitioner's counsel as, as additional reasons, but as a practical matter, as the argument sort of played out, um, since California was not claiming an interest in public disclosure, and since California was promising to do better at actually stopping <laughs> the leaks and hacks of their system so that there would be public disclosure, uh, the notion of being harassed by future solicitors wasn't really in play since it's not like the California Department of Justice is going to solicit you for money, right? They're, they're using it for law enforcement purposes and not publicizing it to others. And the notion of sort of the religious notion of not taking credit for it, I'm not sure really plays out if government just sort of takes this information that you're disclosing to the IRS anyway, so that the, there's already at least a universe larger than the charity itself that knows that you contributed. Uh, it's not like California is meaningfully different than of the IRS in the sense of that religious objection. They're a government entity that is not looking at, not not seeing this information for the purposes of patting you on the back. They're doing it for the purposes of policing the charity. So it's not entirely clear how the religious objection gets would, would realistically be implicated in a meaningful way. Uh, and the, I don't want other people hounding on my door, uh, again, to the extent that California kept this private, um, it wouldn't come into play. So the debate was really more about can they realistically keep it private within the government or is it inevitably going to be leaked or is there a reasonable prospect of it being leaked? And once you sort of shifted into the there's going to be it's going to be leaked to the public view, well, then those secondary concerns uh, 
are fine and are true, but 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 the bigger concern is yeah, and you're going to threat to blow up my house and and attack my kids. Those would be the the the, the they would be a far bigger concern from the justice's perspective and the the sort of don't hound me and uh, I, I want to remain modest are sort of you know thumbs on the scale, but thumbs on the scale of you're going to bomb my house. So I, I don't think they're going to end up playing much of a role, though they were mentioned by by um, the petitioner's counsel. Great. We'll go to our next question now. Yes. Good afternoon. Thanks very much. Fascinating discussion. Uh, two questions, one sort of constitutional, one practical. Uh, the constitutional one, uh, I've heard discussions of, uh, you know, a lot of First Amendment discussions about freedom of speech, freedom of association. Uh, appreciate the, the refinement there about the whether or not freedom of private association is implicated in there. I haven't heard any discussion uh, about um, any constitutional privacy rights. Um, and I know that that's a fraught area, but, you know, there's something there, presumably, around the Fourth and Fifth Amendment area. Um, and I'm curious, uh, in particular, the extent to which there, there are any constraints about administrative inquiries or, or and the like versus uh, a law enforcement inquiry. In fact, I think it's, it's significant that just a moment ago in answering a prior question, you didn't indicate that the purpose of this was law enforcement. So I'm wondering if there is there any uh, there was any discussion or you see any potential implications for narrowing the scope of the government's ability to collect information, which is ultimately used for law enforcement, even if there's no you know immediate clear probable cause implication. Uh, second, more practical question is um, what this might mean for the mechanisms of donation. So, you know, instead of writing a writing a check that can be traced back or making a dropping a wire transfer or something like that, I walk up to the Salvation Army kennel with a roll of thousands and stuff them into that little slot. You know, or or more <laughs> more practically, maybe people start making. Uh, donations through crypto or, or other less traceable means, um, whether or not the petitioners, respondents, or anybody else sort of thought through those second and third order effects? Uh, both good questions. Uh, let me take the second one first, because I think it's just quicker, and cause the first one deserves a bigger answer. Uh, so on the second one, I imagine that if you saw suddenly a shift to people dropping thousands into the Salvation Army bucket or, you know, anonymously mailing it to their favorite controversial group, um, there would quickly be uh, government clamping down on that just because it looks awfully like money laundering. <laughs> and so I imagine you'll soon, you would soon see rules about how any donors, you can't take anonymous donations below, you know, above a certain amount, including from crypto. They would just stop charities from doing that. Uh, and uh, if I had to, to guess, the the sort of Homeland Security-esque concerns of money laundering and, and you know, funding bad groups uh, would be enough to get Congress and states and probably the Supreme Court to sort of say, well, yeah, we have to be able to trace it eventually, even if you can't sort of force blanket disclosure at the front end. So in terms of the mechanism, I agree that's an interesting circumvention path, but I imagine it's one that would be shut down by legal means, ultimately shut down if, if it becomes a big problem. Uh, on the privacy questions, uh, it's a fine point, and in fact, petitioners language in their arguments were wonderfully Fourth Amendment evocative uh, in terms of California asking for disclosure of this information on a suspicionless basis. So you could just sort of hear all the beautiful Fourth Amendment language coming into play. But like with so many other sort of cross pollinated doctrines in the First Amendment, whether it's equal protection or due process or here privacy, uh, you know, they, they mostly get dealt with in the context of the First Amendment rather than in the other derivative amendments. But you could just as easily, you would imagine, bring a, a, a due process and equal protection of privacy claim uh, pointing out that because it, you know, the, the test under those, those um, rights should be heightened because it touches upon a critical area of rights. I mean, you think of due process, right? Due process it gets ratcheted up when it bears upon some other constitutional rights. Equal protection gets ratcheted up when it bears upon some other constitutional right. But we mostly have just sort of cooked those in to First Amendment doctrine to begin with. And so half of the First Amendment doctrine's viewpoint discrimination could just as easily be called equal, equal protection. And I think similarly here, privacy has ultimately just been cooked into certain 
certain aspects of, of free association and it being treated as it's a deterring problem. Because if you think of the Fourth Amendment standing alone, I don't think anyone really thinks it provides very much protection. I understand that the sort of the prophylactic sweep of all the information has this suspicionless, you know, data gathering problem to it. But everyone here agrees that if there was a complaint about a charity, the state of California could issue an individualized subpoena to that charity demanding disclosure of its 10, its, 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 formed, its uh, IRS forms and its, its donors, and that would be okay for a law enforcement purpose because it would have had a specific trigger. Um, and I don't think anyone challenged that, even in, uh, implicitly on a Fourth Amendment grounds, because there would be a complaint because it's a, an entity uh, that is soliciting from California folks because they would want to investigate this. And that would be a sufficient suspicion to get uh, at least a, a, some you know, disclosure of records otherwise uh, made, pub made available to the IRS. Uh, so I just don't see the fourth. The trouble is, while the First Amendment is rapidly plummeting down the levels of protection as we sort of get all bent out of shape uh, about free speech, uh, the Fourth Amendment long ago got stomped on. And, and, you know, the notion of a reasonable search, all we need is to be reasonable and, you know, warrants get kicked out and reasonable probable cause becomes reasonable suspicion becomes you can do whatever you want at the border. Uh, I just don't see that the Fourth Amendment is really going to fill in for or uh, what is admittedly a, a somewhat weakened First Amendment in this context. Great. And we've got time uh, for about one more question. Yep. Do we have a last question? We do. Hi. Uh, thanks for a uh, great presentation. Sorry, I joined late. Um, if you already covered this, could you just comment on who the advocates were who were presenting oral arguments today and the um, relative, uh, basically how they how you thought they did? Uh, I thought Derek Schaefer, uh, who's from Quinn Emanuel, he was on behalf of AFP for the petitioners. He did great, master, masterful uh, knowledge of the record, and I thought very consistent in trying to sort of distinguish this from campaign finance cases and from the IRS, which was a big concern for a number of the justices. Uh, I thought General Prelegar, on behalf of the United States as amicus, having some argument time, I thought she argued quite well. I was appalled by the content uh, of the United States position. But I thought as an advocate, she did quite well. Uh, it's just that the United States position in this is, is a little horrifying from those of us who are sort of on the strong First Amendment side of the world, which I count myself. Uh, and then uh, Ms. I think it was Ms. Feinberg. Give me a second. I wrote it down. So I, I'm sure I can tell you exactly. Uh, yes, Ms. Feinberg, or, or maybe she's a... Uh, Gen, uh, you know, Deputy Attorney General, Ge Attorney General, whatever. I, I'm sure I'm, I'm mangling her title, but uh, she argued on behalf of California. And, uh, you know, she did what she could with the facts in front of her. I thought the facts in front of her were pretty horrible. And I didn't think she was in a very strong position, uh, though I thought as an advocate, again, she sort of did what she could. Uh, it wasn't that much. And the bottom line, she came after the United States, and the United States bore the brunt of most of the questioning. So that by the time they got to her, uh, it was a little less aggressive, in my opinion. Um, and, you know, she uh, she stretched the record as much as she could stretch it, given that the record was pretty bad for California, uh, and tried to have a forward-looking perspective on this, which I think is smart from a state advocate's perspective of whatever we're going to, you know, whatever flaws we had in the past, we're fixing it. <laughs> and and so, so don't make a rule that doesn't let our fix survive, even if you say our old version was lousy. Uh, and I thought that's, you know, that's what... That's, Look, it was a it was a good it was a good path for a government advocate to take. Uh, I was obviously not impressed with the substance of some of her reasons for wanting this information, but that's a meritsy problem rather than an advocacy problem. Uh, you, yeah, you you argue about what you're stuck with, and then she did she did I thought a, a good job arguing with what she was stuck with, which was a pretty crummy record from California's perspective. Thank you. Uh, well, and I, so with that, I, like I would, yeah, do we have time for one oh, more? Go ahead, Eric. 
No, I, I would just say that, uh, I, like I said, I, I thought all the advocates did well. I thought all the justices had interesting, uh, had interesting questions that sort of spoke to it. Uh, you know, from my own sort of legal and political and whatever perspective, I'm a little disappointed that it won't be a stronger First Amendment opinion coming out of this. I suspect, uh, but uh, one can take at least some solace in the fact that I think AFP will prevail ultimately on the as applied portion of this. Uh, I'm less optimistic on the the facial challenge. Alrighty. Well, with that, on behalf of the Federalist Society, I want to thank you, Eric, for the benefit of your valuable time and expertise today. Eric actually did double duty. He just uh, moderated a panel earlier today. So uh, our thanks for your, the benefit of your, your time. Uh, of course, thank you to the audience for calling in for your great questions. Um, uh, thanks for joining us for this this review of these uh, oral arguments heard earlier today. And just a reminder, we welcome your feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. Also check your email on our website for announcements about upcoming teleforum calls, coverage of Supreme Court decisions and oral arguments like this one, and Zoom events. And with that, thanks for joining us. Until next time, we are adjourned. Thank you for listening to this episode of Teleform, a podcast of the Federalist Society's practice groups. For more information about the Federalist Society, the practice groups, and to become a Federalist Society member, please visit our website at fedsoc.org.